Good morning, everyone. Welcome to First Five. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Leah Yancey. I am the admin for training. I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Carla Keener. Good morning. How's everybody? Good. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, this is such a timely topic. Um, there's so many crazy things going around right now that let us all know that our work around equity and justice um, still needs a lot of work. And so you are here and we are a mighty, a, a, crowd, a small crowd but a mighty crowd. So thank you so much for being here. You all have Kiko's um, bio on your um, packet, so I don't need to go into that. We know that she's extremely qualified. We know that she has diverse experience. She's worked here locally, she's worked at the state level, she's worked at internationally in Mexico and Guatemala. She's done a lot to really advance the cause of folks who have not had the um, best treatment or the best, um, um, I'm trying to think how to say this, who haven't been given the best um, step of their life. And so she's always um, heralded the cause of justice for those who haven't had a voice or a seat at the table. But we're also thankful because in our new strategic plan, First Five has called out in our vision statement the need to focus on equity, the need to focus on the causes of poverty, which end up with the disparities and inequities that we see here in our county, here in our state, and here in our country and world. And I think the topic of we're in this together is important because no one program, no one agency, no one department can do it alone. And so all of us together need to address this. And so Kiko, uh, in addition to what you see in bio, also serves on our Help Kiko Steering Committee. She heads up a, few, a number of initiatives around early childhood and maternal, maternal child health, and has come from a department here in our county that is really uh, taking the lead in our country to look at these issues around health equity. So we are so grateful to have somebody right here in our backyard who is a champion of these causes and is going to share with us her perspective, the department's perspective, and better yet, hopefully, give us a call to action on how we can join her, join the department, join the efforts here at First Five, and looking at what we can do to truly focus on um, in advance what we can do for um, equity for young children and their families. So please join in welcoming the director of the Family Health Services Division of the Alameda County Department of Public Health, Kiko Allen. either in the health department or in other coalitions. So um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'm excited about it because often when I do this talk, I have to rush through it. So today I feel like I won't have to rush. And um, I, ge I generally have a very um, informal presentation style. So please ask questions at any point. You don't have to wait till the end. We can have conversations about things as they come up. Um, this topic is, a, is can be kind of a heavy one. Um, and I think what I really want to focus on today, based on what folks said, those of you who did fill out the pre-survey, a lot of people said, I understand the theory, I really want to see what it is that's happening in the county to address these issues, and I definitely want to get there. But I also want to start with just laying the groundwork so that everybody's on the same page in terms of what we're talking about. And also just being clear on a couple of, of concepts. There are three key concepts that get thrown around a lot. One is the social determinants of health, and that's in the title of my talk, thing, of my talk. And I wanted to start by saying that I sometimes have a little bit of a hard time with that word determinants, because it sounds very final. Like, if you are in this situation, then your outcome is determined. And I know that especially families um, with um, children with special health care needs have really taken objection to that term, because it sounds like if your child has a special, you know, some kind of a is that the fragile has some kind of special condition and their life trajectory is determined and it's going to be like this and it's going to be less than optimal. And I think that feels limiting. So what I really like to think about more is that we're going to focus on the social conditions that influence health and what, how that all plays out and what we as public health professionals and early childhood professionals can do to address that. The, other, the two other things are the life force perspective or life force theory which we'll talk about, which is also kind of in the same arena, and also the concept of health equity that Carla referenced a couple of times in her intro, and how that's connected to social justice, and how social justice is really at the root of what all of us should be doing in terms of if we really want to um, ensure good health for everyone. 
So that's kind of what we're going to do. So I'll give you kind of some statistics. I do have some data. The public health department, we love our data. We really, we're responsible in the public health department for collecting population level data and sharing it with the world. I feel like we don't do that as much as we should. So I want to spend some time doing that today, getting clear on the definitions and what we're talking about, and then maybe then taking a break and then moving into some um, practical solutions and hearing from a lot of you as well, because I know that many of you in the room are doing the work differently as a result of being immersed in this idea that we have to think about broader um, context in order to improve the health and well-being of families that we're working with. So this will be a conversation more than me just talking all the time, although I will be talking to you. So any questions about that? I also did bring leftover Halloween candy on the table. I'm sure that's in violation. I know it's in violation of the Alameda County Public Health Department Nutrition Services Policy, but uh, we'll make an exception since it's you know that time of year. Uh, so feel free. And there's also food at the back and coffee, so help yourself at any time. And you know where the bathrooms are. Please feel free. You don't need to wait for a break if you need to use the restroom. Uh, wow, what a great group of people. It's so diverse. I mean, we have folks from public health, city of Berkeley, and Alameda County people from hospitals and clinics, the housing authority, the Y, um, domestic violence specialists. It's really a great group, and I think that's so important because if we really are going to affect change that has deep roots in communities and can really have an impact on folks' health, we need people from all different sectors. So it's great that we're starting off this conversation with people from different agencies in the room. So that's really exciting. And I think we'll be able to touch on most of the things that people said they hope to get out of it. We're definitely going to talk about some data initially. Um, there were some um, requests for talking about policy, which I will get to at the end. I think that's really, the more I think about this, the more I feel like policy interventions are so much what needs to happen in terms of shifting uh, the dynamic for uh, families, low-income families in particular in our county. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about some programmatic things. I asked Lauren if she's going to be here the whole time because First Five is also shifting their focus and doing more things. You know, Carla, if you're here the whole time, you can also participate. But doing more um, efforts that are really rooted in the concept of um, health equity and social conditions. So they're really, we really will have an opportunity to learn from each other and maybe even to build some bridges and think about how we can work more closely together as a result of what we're talking about today. So. All right, so let's go ahead and get started then. I do want to start by saying that, you know, as Angela said, we've been in this work together for a long time. I am just a spokesperson for the health department that has done a tremendous amount of work. The people in the room are, have done, are doing a tremendous amount of work um, serving low-income families and, and clients in our community. So uh, the information I'm presenting really represents um, the expertise of a whole lot of people at Alameda County Public Health, and I'm just the lucky one to get to talk to you all today. So. I'm glad that I'm not the only public health representative in the room and that other folks who can chime in at any point to give more detail. So, um, so here are the learning objectives that were in the flyer announcing this training. So we're all clear that we're going to talk initially about um, the social determinants of health or social conditions, what we mean by that, how it's connected to health equity and the life course perspective, the life course theory. How many people are familiar with that concept of life course perspective, the life course theory? Raise your hand if you've heard that before. Okay, good, so not anybody. Um, then we'll talk about how social conditions can influence the health of women, children, fathers, and families. I'm gonna give you some examples of um, what the way, some of the ways that Alameda County uh, Public Health is addressing the social determinants of health. I have a couple of slides in here about other efforts that I know of in the county that are not from the health department that are looking at how we address health differently from a broader perspective. And then I also hope to hear from other folks in the room about their ideas. And then maybe you'll leave here hopefully with some ideas for how you might be able to do your work a little bit differently. And it doesn't mean you have to stop doing what you're doing or completely reinvent your program. There might be some things that you can learn from today that will just give you a different focus or allow you to just tweak your work in a slightly different way that maybe will have it be more effective. So that's the hope. So I like to start by talking about what Alameda County Public Health Department's vision is for health equity. So equity is about fairness. It's about social justice. And what this means is that this is kind of our, our way of describing it, is that the vision is that everyone in Alameda County, no matter where they live, how much money they make, or the color of their skin, has access to the same opportunities to lead a healthy, fulfilling, and productive life. So it doesn't matter what your upbringing is, what neighborhood you live in, what, you know, what color your skin is, because we know that in our society, people of, people of color have unequal opportunities because of our legacy of discrimination, and whatever, all the discriminatory and, and um, policies that we implemented over the generations in our in our society that we're in this place now 
where the, the playing field is not level. And that has a, a profound, so that social inequality has a profound impact on people's health. It makes sense intuitively, but what I'm going to do is build a case for why that makes sense biologically, um, so that we can see why it's so important to address the social conditions in which people are living. So if everybody had those same opportunities, then we wouldn't see these big gaps in life expectancy, infant mortality, some of these other things I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. And that's the concept of health equity, that everyone has the same access to have to be as healthy as they can be. And there aren't social conditions or other barriers that are outside of those people's purview, that are out of their control, that are structural things that have an influence on their health. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about so I'm the maternal, paternal, child, and adolescent health director, in addition to being the family health services division director for the public health department. So I concern myself with the data about maternal, paternal, child, and adolescent health in our county. And what we know about pregnancy outcomes, so whether women are having healthy babies and healthy pregnancies, whether those babies are living to see their first birthday. If a baby doesn't, infant mortality is a baby that doesn't live to see its first birthday. So, and that the infant mortality rate is something that we, is a very um, important indicator of health, but it's also an important indicator of mm, kind of the, the social well-being of the country. In fact, the CIA and many other entities track infant mortality internationally as a barometer of the measure of well-being of that particular country. So countries with higher infant mortality are seen as having, you know, some stuff going on. It's, it's a very sensitive indicator. Um, and what we're seeing with things like infant mortality is that there are, there are the, the rate has gone down, I'll show you some slides in a minute, but there are some concerns about disparities that we see between different groups of people that stem from these social inequalities that I talked about a little bit. We also know that, like, that things like low birth weight and preterm birth rates um, have, have been increasing. They were pretty much increasing quite drastically from 1981 to 2006. They're coming down a little bit now. But th these are indicators that are stubborn and persistent indicators. They, they, despite the fact that most women do get prenatal care, and we've done a really good job of that. I think your average person knows if someone's pregnant, they need to get prenatal care. Get it as, soon, as early as possible. Most, that's like, we've done a good job with that message. People get that. But it hasn't really made a difference in some of these indicators in preterm birth and low birth weight across the spectrum. And it definitely hasn't made a difference in terms of reducing the gap in outcomes that I'm going to talk about in a second. So in the African American community, you see much higher rates of preterm birth and low birth weight and infant mortality than you do in other communities. And there, there are a couple of other communities also that are disproportionately affected in this way, despite access to medical care. That's quite good. Um, so I think I've covered all that. I, you know, I, this is, issue, I'll just say one more time, the issue of the African American uh, infant and maternal mortality rates being so much higher. I have a colleague from New York City who recently told me that in New York City, African American women are 12 times more likely to die as a result of pregnancy than um, white women. In New York City, in 2017, that's pretty shocking. So that really tells us that there's something going on in our society, with our systems, that is perpetuating unfairness that is resulting in real deep differences in health outcomes. Uh, and as I mentioned, there are other communities, such as Pacific Islanders and Native Americans, we'll talk about a little bit more, that also experience some health disparities that really do stem from social conditions and social you know, unequal treatment. Um, I'll just say right here, I do a little plug for, um, for data, uh, for those of you who are data geeks. We, traditionally, as, um, Asians and Pacific Islanders have been lumped together. So you see APIs you know, in, a, in a data spreadsheet. Um, Pacific Islanders are really very different. Well, the whole Asian group is a very diverse group in general. But Pacific Islanders tend to be extreme, are really very different from other Asian groups. And so in Alameda County, we've been able to disaggregate those data. So we're just looking at Pacific Islander data separate from Asians. And we're able to see when we do that that there are some disparities in birth outcomes among, among Pacific Islanders. Because they have a very different trajectory and a different sort of social um, condition in our, in our country. So you'll see more about that in a second. Yeah, right. yeah keep going. Um, going back to your first two points up there on the low birth weights and, and, and mortality rates. So the, are, you, are you suggesting there that the, the decline, the slow, I'll be a slow decline of, of, uh, uh, you know, of these deaths, of these rates, is because of the improved access? It's just taking a long time for that to take effect? Or is there something else coming into play, something else that's being done now that that perhaps we'll talk about later that's contributing to, the, to this 
Sorry. Yeah, I'll show you a graph about infant mortality, and we'll talk about that in a second. So I'll, I'll answer your question as we get a little further into the, into the talk, I think. And if I don't, please let me know. Okay. Um, so here's the infant mortality rate trend in Alameda County over the last 15 years. The most recent data that we have are from 2014. So you won't see any 15, 16 data because we don't have those yet from the states they haven't given to us. So this is the most recent data that you'll see. But basically, this is um, this is good, right? I mean, this is not a huge difference between 4.9 and 4.0, but it's a slope that's going in the right direction. Um, and this, I'll say, is largely due to the fact that we are a lot better at taking care of really sick babies than we used to be. So you know, some of you work in neonatal intensive care units, you know how medically specialized that care can be. If a baby's born really preterm, that baby probably wouldn't have survived 30 years ago, but has a much better chance of surviving now. So that means that they don't die before their first birthday. So our infant mortality rate is, is a lot, has come down to some degree because of that. But the preterm birth rate has not so much, and you'll see that in a second. Um, and, and so this, I think we can say, is due to some public health things, but it's also due to better health care or more advanced health care. I think we all know we have problems with our health care system and access to it, but we have some incredible technology that can save lives. Yeah. To that point, do you talk about then the children that are saved by technology and what the quality of life afterwards was made them have lots of challenges after? It's a great it's a great point. Um, I'm, I'm not going to talk about that so much today. I think there are probably some people in the room who could really speak to that. Um, but it's certainly a challenge. And, and every child is different. Some kids are born super preterm and they end up doing miraculously well. And others have lifelong disabilities. So you never really know what the, the outcome is going to be sometimes with those cases. Um, but it is it has increased um, our costs, certainly, that we're taking care of really medically fragile babies for long periods of time. Not that it's a bad thing, you know, but it, it's complicated. It's not without, you know, some questions. Um, so this, this shows that we've done a really good job of prenatal care. So in the, in the early 1980s, prenatal care wasn't so much the norm. And then there was a huge push for universal prenatal care. Um, and that helped to deal with some things, like um, oh, I think there were some outcomes that were improved. I can't think what they are off the top of my head. But what I do know is that outcomes that didn't really improve during the 80s, 90s, and the early 2000s were things like preterm birth. So even though women were getting into prenatal care, and doing what they needed to do, there's some other things in operation that were driving rates of preterm birth that couldn't necessarily be fixed in the nine months of prenatal care. So that's why prenatal care wasn't necessarily the fix for preterm birth, as you'll see in a second. Um, so we've done, we continue to do fairly well. You see some dips, but generally, you know, almost 95%. Here's the So this is, um, this black line here is all races together. So, you know, pretty much around 90%. So the vast majority of women are getting early prenatal care. And this is first trimester prenatal care. For those of you who work in the clinical setting, you know that it can be challenging for people to get in that early because it's hard to get appointments. Sometimes women don't find out that they're pregnant until maybe they're 10 weeks along, and then it might be hard to get in in the first trimester. So this is a very sensitive indicator. Um, we are beyond first trimester, prenatal care access rates are even higher. So um, this is kind of like a very high bar to be setting, first trimester prenatal access. Um, but you can see that there's some disparities. Generally, though, among these groups, not so different. The one, the big disparity is with the Pacific Islander community in Alameda County. And again, as I said earlier, we would not have discovered this if these folks had been lumped in with, the, with, the other, with other regions. Um, and so this is something that we have a program for in at the public health department, we're doing outreach to Pacific Islander women to try to understand why they don't access prenatal care. It has a lot to do with not trusting providers or it not being sort of a normal thing for women when they're pregnant to see a doctor because it just is part of life and why would you go see a physician or a nurse practitioner or a midwife, it's just a normal thing. So this is something that we're trying to look at because we do see slightly higher rates of preterm birth in the Pacific Islander population. Yeah? Do we know on offhand what was happening in that period of uh, 2008, 2010, and this Yeah, it, you know, it's, it's, this, is, this is the challenge with data, is that we often don't know what precipitates these things. I mean, it could be economics that has something to do with it. It could be a change in immigration patterns from uh, like people, you know, settling into different neighborhoods from the Pacific Islander community. Um, I, I really don't have an answer to that. And, and by the same token, I think we don't have data from more recent years to see if our outreach is making a difference and if this is going back up. 
But, and even if it is, we don't know for certain. It, it's hard to prove that, that your outreach is helping to get women in doors. Everyone, the whole trend went down. The whole trend went down, yeah, a little bit, yeah. yeah. No, I'm not, it's a great question, I'm not so really sure. <laughs> Could have had something to do with health care access, change of insurance policies, things like that, but I'm just not aware of it. Um, so here's the percentage of premature births by race ethnicity from 2000 to 2014. Um, some of these, you can see that the, this line here, this is the Pacific Islander line. It's a small number of uh, Pacific Islanders that are born in our county. So when you have smaller numbers, the lines tend to be a little bit jumpier because they're just not that many. It doesn't represent that many people. Um, so it's not as stable. Um, that's why that looks like that. But in general, you know, and we see some progress here that in the African American community, the premature birth rate came down by a couple of percentage points. But you still see a big gap here, almost a two time gap between the Latino community and the African American community in terms of rates of premature birth. And then these, you know, are again coming down, but not like the, the curve that you saw with infant mortality. It's very um, kind of stubborn, stubbornly sticking at this. So again, even though women are getting prenatal care, it's not really having an impact on this indicator. Um, say low birth weight is even more this way. See, they, these lines are just not really going in a downward trajectory in any kind of a you know, consistent fashion. Again, you see a slight uh, decrease, but you still see this gap between African Americans and the white community or most other communities in terms of high rates. Questions about any of that? <clears throat> and then this just shows, this is data from 2014. Um, the, and I didn't, I didn't define it, I'm sorry. Does anybody know what preterm birth is? What's the definition of a baby that's born preterm? I'm sure some of you can tell me. Okay. No? Before, let's see, before 37 weeks is considered preterm. So, and you know, for those of you who aren't in, in the, the OB world, we talk about pregnancy being 40 weeks of pregnancy, which is sort of 10 months, and most people think of 9 months of being pregnancy. It's complicated, I'm not going to go into it now, but so 40 weeks is full gestation, 37 weeks is essentially a month early. And then babies that are born before 32 weeks are considered very preterm. And then in terms of low birth weight, um, low birth weight is less than 2,500, oops, sorry, 2,500 grams which is about 5.5 pounds, and then very low birth weight is less than 1,500 grams, which is about 3.3 3 pounds. Yes. I just had a question, um, I think like two slides back, which you don't have to mention, but there was like a severe dip in the data, and I was gonna ask the same question of, you know, you know what was going on. And so if we don't, um, because that wasn't provided to you, or we're not sure what's going on, how like how are we designing programs and legislation to address that when we don't know what cost it to begin with? Yeah, see what we really want to look for is we want to achieve things that continue to go down. So when you can see that something that it's not just a blip like that, then then you know that you're more in the right direction in terms of having found policies or whatever they are that are working. It's a really great question that you ask, and I think that in public health we haven't been so good about evaluating programs because we have our charge to do population-based work and, and we do what we're supposed to do, but we haven't often built in evaluation pieces. Now there's much more scrutiny for this kind of work, especially in tight budget times. So, and I'll be talking a little bit more about how we're building evaluation. Um, but there's always a challenge of knowing because these problems are multifactorial. In pre term birth, there are many things that contribute to it. What one, if you only did one thing, would that make a 20% difference? Or if you did two things, would that make a 40% difference? Or which one thing is better to do than the other? It's so hard to teach out. So it's kind of like we just try lots of different things and hope for the line to keep going steadily downward. Yeah, Carla. Yes, we can just discuss it at our table. That was also kind of a great housing recession. And so yeah. um, and since right. we also had a disparate impact on certain communities, you would expect to see the impact on those communities in terms of access to healthcare and their program. Yeah. As well. Possibly. I think you're right, and I think, that, and the point, one of the points of this talk is that there are some things that we can do that um, will bring down certain, will bring down the rates of these, you know, adverse outcomes, like um, you know, home visiting is something, or making sure that every day he is put to sleep in a safe sleep position on his back, you know, not with lots of stuffed toys and blankets around him or her. Those things will make a difference to a certain degree. But where you get stuck is when the social conditions are in operation. And you can do education about safe sleep until you're blue in the face, 
or make sure that women get into prenatal care, every single woman, and you're still not going to reduce it beyond a certain point because it's the social stuff that's really keeping it that way. So not to say that it isn't good to do those other things, it's important and they're necessary, but they're not sufficient and they're not going to fix the problem until we look at the broader factors. Um, so again, this just illustrates that we continue to have this disparity, um, especially between African Americans and whites, and I will talk more about, about why that is. Does that answer your question, Ray? Did I get to your question? I'm not going to um, Satisfactorily, it was great. <laughs> <laughs> I do have another question. All right. Asians here, um, in, on this particular chart, yeah. showing that uh, their their rate of, uh, of the low birth weight is pretty high. And, and yet, they were also pretty high in terms of their their access to, to care, to care yeah. right? Right. Do you understand what's going on? Well, so here's the other tricky thing. As I said, none of this is really cut and dry. But with low birth weight, there is a certain genetic component. Um, so if we look at Pacific Islander people versus people from Japan, Pacific Islander people in general are bigger people. They're taller, they have higher BMIs. They're from a different genetic stock. Whereas folks from China and Japan tend to be a little bit smaller. So sometimes you have low birth weight babies in a population that, that does have to do with that group of folks just being slightly smaller people. And it might not necessarily be an indicator of an adverse condition or lack of care or something like that. So again, it's hard to think about all of these things that go into the equation. It's higher, but it's not as high. And it's not, as, it's not much higher than the other groups. So that's why you can see it's a genetic variation versus something that's really a disparate outcome, a big gap that indicates that something else is going on. Yeah, I just want to add a, a personal anecdote. Um, I had a preterm labor child, and she's 28 and fine. Mm -hmm. She weighed five pounds, six ounces. And I'm just going to do some self-reflection on, on why it was that I didn't end up with problems or you know, a bad outcome. Mm -hmm. So just, just what my environment was, what my genetic record is. But anyway, I was just thinking about that. So, so I'm a statistic, but it all worked out fine. So I'm just yeah. thinking about why I was doing Right. And thanks for bringing that up because the other thing that I've realized is really sensitive about this is that I am talking about numbers and their statistics, but there are people behind those numbers. Mm -hmm. and, and to lose a baby or have a baby born preterm is difficult. I'm so glad that your dog was okay, but I'm sure it was stressful at the time. No born miscarriage in the So there you go. So you experienced a lot of loss, and that's very, especially losing a small child is really, really tough for folks. So I do want to, you know, I, we can get lost in this, and we do need to look at it, but we also need to pull ourselves out and remember there are stories behind these statistics, and, and these are people's lives. And um, yeah, so thanks for that. Um, okay, so again, this is a slide that's particularly upsetting to me right now because, as you can see, so this is our infant mortality rate trend over the last 15 years, broken down by race ethnicity. You can see again that with the African American community, we were making some progress. You heard from Denisha and Danielle, they work in one of our programs that's specifically targeting African American women. And in that program, in 2009, the, um, the rate of infant mortality among participants in that program was much lower than this. It was you know, five or four or something like that. Or I don't even, you know, we, it's very rare that we lose a baby in our programs. It does happen sometimes, but it's rare. So, in the program that they're working in, it really made a difference. But in the community at large, for, not everyone can be part of that program. In the community at large, there's still some stuff going on with this um, with this line. So it was pretty low. It came down to 7.6 per thousand in 2009, and now it's back up to 11.4. And I, I do want to say that we're having some issues with data quality. All of these data are pulled from the birth certificates. So if any of you know birth books who work in the hospitals or the ones who interview moms that just had a baby and help them to fill out the form about when their last prenatal visit, when their last period was, the prenatal visit, and who's the father of the baby if there is one, and what their race, ethnicity, all that stuff. We draw, the, ra the race, ethnicity data comes from that birth certificate. And we're having some challenges right now in some of the hospitals with birth books not filling out that race, ethnicity data. So it could be inflating a little bit the statistic. This, I'm hoping that it's not as high as this. But it's still absolutely going in the wrong direction. And I think to the earlier questions that people have posed, think about what's been going on in this time frame. A lot of social disruption, you know, beginnings of gentrification displacement, um, really hard for, for low-income folks to, to make it in Alameda County. And I'm certain, as you'll see from other things I'll tell you about, that those have an impact on infant mortality and low birth weight and preterm birth. Low birth weight and preterm birth are drivers of infant mortality in addition to being problems in 
So this is something that the Board of Supervisors is aware of, that we're paying a lot of attention to in the Public Health Department, because we need to look at our programs that, that do work. We know that our home visiting programs work, but they, they don't reach everybody that needs to be reached. How can we reach those folks who aren't being reached? What are some other things that we can do? What are the policy solutions that need to be um, you know, put into place in order to look at this? These are all the questions that we're asking ourselves right now. OK, so all right. So you heard a lot, I'm discussing, about how there's lots of disparities that stem from social inequality and other things. Um, what should we be doing differently? Prenatal care is necessary. It's important. It's not, it's not sufficient. It's not everything. Health education is important, necessary, but isn't going to fix everything. So what should we be doing differently? And the life course theory was popularized by a man named Michael Liu, who was an OBGYN at um, UCLA, who was looking at these outcomes and thinking, something, something needs to be different. We, need, we can't fix issues that are driving things like preterm birth and, and, and low birth weight in the nine months of prenatal care. We really need to expand our lens and think about um, health before pregnancy for women, or think about what are the broader contextual factors that are influencing women's health even before they become pregnant that could be driving high rates of infant and maternal morbidity and mortality. So that's what the life court, it's, it's, it's an idea that had been in circulation for some time, but he wrote some articles and kind of popularized this idea. But we have to look across the life course of women and also across the life course of generations because we do see patterns. Women who've had low birth weight babies are more likely to have children who in turn have low birth weight babies because of a lot of this uh, sort of transgenerational deprivation and social inequality over generations that we'll see more about. So the three tenets of life force theory. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, to go back to yes. the data. The Latino Hispanic population, does that get broken down in terms of immigrants recently arrived and um, those that are, you know, second, third generation? Yeah, so in addition to the questions of actually asking about Latino data and whether we break it down by first generation or second or third generation. And we have not been able to do that. I think we it would be a little tricky. It could be done, and we should do it, because what we do know is that there, that immigrant women, Latino and Asian immigrant women, are more likely to have better pregnancy outcomes than women who've been in this country for a number of years, or for a couple of generations. So that also kind of tells you something about the, what you're exposed to when you're in this country in terms of changing, so changing degrees of social support, changing environment, changing diet, all those sorts of things have an impact on women's health. So it's a very good point, I'm glad you brought it up. Um, and, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say just on that point, um, you remember a study, I don't know who did it, in Minnesota where there were women who came from Africa? Yeah. I don't remember if it was Ethiopia or Somalia, but after being here for a period of years, they had the same outcomes as African American women from here. So that always reminds me of how much of an impact social determinants have that can change the right. and change the course of things. Yeah, so much of it is about the environment that you're living in. Yeah. And then I have a second question. With the Asian group, for so many different communities from different ethnic backgrounds, that, that um, I always feel that looking at, you know, outcomes on uh, seem better for the Asian community, but for immigrant women, and then what country you're from, your ethnic background, you know, that is broken up. Um, I know now the Asian Health Service and some of these organizations are doing it, but just to lump everybody together doesn't give you a really clear picture of sometimes feels yeah. you know, Latino women and yeah. other communities as well. Yeah, it's true. Uh, there are a lot of issues with how we collect data, mm -hmm. and some of the categories are set at the federal level. Um, in terms of even collecting data on Hispanics, you know, if you remember when you fill out a form, you have to say white of Hispanic origin, black of Hispanic origin. So it's just, it's, it's, and it, it's, it stems from the fact that race is a social construct, right? and that we really need to get beyond that, people. You know, it's time to just move beyond that, and it's really more about people's experiences, their ethnicity, you know, what they, that, that's what's driving their health, not the color of their skin necessarily, although we know that people of color experience disproportionate or, you know, discriminatory treatment, but it's not genetics, it's about experience, and we need to collect data that more reflect that, I think is to your point, versus sort of something that seems to be genetic to us. Um, so, and uh, it's, it's tricky, it's complicated, <laughs> you know, and the other thing is folks from, say, Iran and the Middle East are captured under the Caucasian category, because there isn't one for them. They're considered white. So that's a problem. 
problem because that's a completely different culture of that kind of experience. So all that to say, we do our best. I mean, it really could be something that could be completely reframed, and that you know is some that's a big project. But I did want to draw your attention to on your um, tables. There are some extra slides. So I did. I know I used to hate it when presenters do this, but I did make a couple changes to my slide deck from what you have in terms of your, your master color handouts. And so I added some extra slides there. And um, so if you can sort of you can take a look at those. I just wanted to draw your attention to. Oh, oh there's pretty 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 pretty. Does everybody have that? Yeah, there are packets of about six slides, just kind of alternated, not stapled. Sorry about that. But I got some data just yesterday that I wanted to make sure that I excluded, and that's why I saw this for you. But the first thing I wanted to, to show you is, because we're talking about babies being born in our county. So there's, there's this shape that says number of births, and this is not a slide that I'm going to show you, it's just one that you have. Number of births by race ethnicity. So you can see that in 2014, we had 19,500 births, which is less, when I started my job, about 21,000, so birth rate's going down over the last seven years that I've been in this job. Um, the majority were Asian, that's also new. It used to be majority Latino. Um, and so, and that's, so that's kind of how it all breaks out in terms of the numbers of births in 2014 by race ethnicity. Um, and then if you look at the second slide, it's the birth rate. So that's the, the, the number of live births per thousand population. So you can see here the Pacific Islanders have the highest birth rate, 18.1 per thousand. So they're a small group of people. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head how many people there are, or how many Pacific Islanders there are in our county, maybe somebody here knows. Um, pretty small group and, and concentrated in certain areas of the county, but they have a high birth rate. They're having more babies per their population than other, um, other groups. So that's just to give you sort of set the stage in terms of who's having babies in the county right now. And then the last one that I wanted to show you is the percentage birth to foreign born moms. Um, and you can see that of the foreign born mom births, Asians are making up a larger percentage um, than, say, Latinos or uh, others. So let me make sure I'm doing this right. Um, yeah, so it, what it means is that it's not, it's that in the Asian community, 81.8% of births are foreign born moms. In the Latino community, 54.2% of the births are foreign born moms. So those are, are, those are, statistically speaking, babies that you would expect to do a little bit better because of this immigrant protective effect that we talked about, how living in this country somehow has a toxic effect on people's health. So if you come from another country, you bring a lot of protective factors with you. Maybe you're living in a small ethnic enclave with a lot of people that you know well, family members, you have a lot of social support, you might have a traditional diet that's healthier than the American diet. Those kinds of things can contribute to their health in general. So. Okay, so to go back to this life course theory. Um, so we have to look at infant and maternal morbidity and mortality more broadly. There are two basic ideas between the life course theory. First is this idea that chronic stress has a cumulative impact on health and well-being, both individually and across generations. Stress, stress is not good for health. And that early pro programming plays a significant role in health and social outcomes. Many of us work in early childhood. We know how important it is to intervene early. This early program idea, programming idea really shows how health is set sometimes very early in life. So intervening during that early period is important. And the critical periods of development are of those times when a lot is going on developmentally in a person. Pregnancy, infancy, and all <coughs> adolescence are considered really critical periods of development in which it's important to ensure good health. So what's early programming? Um, and this is a quote from one of the articles that I listed as providing the academic background for this talk, which I know is needed for CEUs. So early programming is this idea that early experiences can program an individual's future health and development. So that includes both prenatal programming, what's going on in the womb, and also intergenerational programming. So a woman's experience as a mother or as a woman of childbearing age can be influenced by what her mother's experience was and what her grandmother's experience was having babies. Um, so, and those kinds of things can make an individual more vulnerable or susceptible to developing a disease or condition in the future. And this was really, um, this, this was elevated as a theory that had data supporting it by a man named Barker, who developed this Barker hypothesis, which was not very well received when he initially um, thought of it. But he was able to show a correlation between um, individuals that were born low birth weight and their, and their risk for coronary heart disease late in life. So you see here, uh, this, the y-axis is the risk for coronary heart disease. So as it goes up, 
up, your risk is greater. And then this is your birth weight. So here's low birth weight, five pounds, up to 10 pounds. So the, the smaller you are at birth, the greater your risk of coronary heart disease. Um, and he was able to do this through a longitudinal study. He had to, you know, he looked at people who developed heart disease, and then he went back and found their birth certificates and figured out how much they weighed, and was able to make this correlation. Um, and then the theory basically is that if you're, you know, if, you're, if there's some kind of deprivation during the pregnancy time period, if your mom is under a lot of stress, if she's not eating well, that the organs are not going to form in quite the right way, and that that is going to have a debilitating effect on you later in life, that your heart wouldn't be as strong as it needs to be because of what happened to you when you were a fetus in the uterus. Um, he found the same thing with insulin resistance syndrome. Um, so again, the smaller you are, at lower birth weight, much higher risk of um, developing insulin, <coughs> insulin resistance syndrome, which is a precursor to diabetes later in life. And the theory, I think, with this one was that um, if, you're, if you end up with a smaller pancreas than the average adult because you're deprived during pregnancy or you're, when you're a fetus, then your, um, your pancreas won't be able to deal as well with um, sugar in your body and that puts you at risk for diabetes later. So this is pretty compelling in terms of actual health outcomes that stems from really early programming. It's not about what happens later, it's what happens to you earlier. And I think what, it, again, is important here is that it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be this way, right? There, if you were born low birth weight, it doesn't mean that you're going to end up with a higher risk for diabetes. But if you're born low birth weight and you're more likely to be living in an environment where you don't have the resources that you need and there are a lot of social stressors and other things, <coughs> then you're not going to be able to overcome that initial hit that you took earlier in life and it might end up in this kind of trajectory. And that's why the work that we do to try to help families maybe change their situations can have a positive impact on um, health outcomes. The other concept is cumulative impact. So that while individual episodes of stress might have minimal impact or even maybe be kind of beneficial, it's okay to get a little stressed out once in a while, kind of get your heart beating and activates your system. But if you're stressed out all the time, if you're living in an environment where you're constantly exposed to discrimination and racism, where you don't know where your next meal is coming from, or you're worried about being those are all things that cause stress in the body, which increases what we call the allostatic load, the amount of cortisol in the system that is unhealthy and can lead to inflammation. Preterm birth is an inflammatory process. There's something going on in the system. The uterus gets inflamed in a way that it wants to deliver the baby early. And that can be something that's a stress-mediated process. So just to illustrate that, OK, you see a tiger. What do you, what do? You do? Run, right? Run, run away from the tiger. You pet the tiger. No. Um, so that's protective. They're either, you're encountering something really unusual. When are we going to run into a tiger? Probably never. But something like that, the equivalent of that in an urban environment, or a car crash or something like that. Um, so you run away, you get out of there, you had, your, your body responds in the way that it needs to. You've increased cardiac output, you have increased available glucose, so you can run really fast. You know, stories of moms who lift up cars because their babies are caught underneath them. You know, that's the body getting into high gear because there's a stressful situation that you must respond to. Um, and enhanced immune function. Those are all protective. If this happens a lot, though, if you're having to, if your system goes into overdrive consistently, you know, several times a day over weeks, years, decades, then you run into a situation where you're stressed out. And that's toxic. We talk about toxic stress, um, I think, which is, a, which is something that affects both moms and dads, but also babies. And it's not as easy to kind of see with babies that, you know, we know when our friend maybe is stressed out because she's talking to us about all these things that have happened and how difficult her life is, but a baby's not going to be able to say to you, I'm stressed out. So a lot of the work that we do is trying to figure out how babies are in environments that are stressed and how they're responding to that stress, which can be really damaging to their health, and how we can help to, help, help to either eliminate that stress or work with the family to manage the stress. So that kind of stress is toxic to cause hypertension and cardiovascular disease, insulin resistance, as we talked about before, and also infection, inflammation, as I mentioned. Those are drivers of things like preterm birth. So that's kind of, this is the, the illustration of biology. This is how stress gets into the body and causes poor outcomes. Now we're going to talk a little bit more about where that stress can come from. And this slide is one that illustrates how a, a trajectory of, this is a person, this is, here, let's start with this one. So here's a pregnant woman, okay? 
So, and here are the possible trajectories for her child. It could be a leg trajectory that is optimal and is moving upwards, uh, high health potential, or a leg trajectory that is less than optimal, has lower health potential. And we see here, someone mentioned protective factors earlier. These green arrows are protective factors. These are things like social support, good nutrition, friends to talk to, that help to void that life trajectory, make it um, higher in terms of life <coughs> And then risk factors are things like, um, you know, living in a, a neighborhood where you have to worry about gun violence, or um, worrying that you're going to be evicted from your house, not being able to get a PG needle. All those kinds of things are risk factors that depress a, um, a life trajectory. And what can happen then, so here's this concept of early programming, is that what happens, we talked about this with the Barker hypothesis, if you don't get good nutrition in the room, in, your, in the womb, or if you're exposed to pollutants or drugs or other things, your mom's health, her stress, her state of mind, those are all things that shape that baby's health. And, and already put it at sort of a, it, what, right out of the gate, that baby's <coughs> life trajectory is not optimal. It's already been somewhat, it, it, that baby's taken a hit because of what that mom experienced. And I think what's really important here is that we not, and I'm going to talk about this a whole lot, so we'll hear more, that we not um, sort of, that this argument doesn't degenerate into mommy blame. Oh, mom was stressed out during pregnancy. You have to take care of yourself because your baby's not going to be okay if you don't. A lot of reasons why moms are stressed or why infant mortality is high have to do with things that are outside that mom's control. There are structural factors that we as a society should be compelled to address. And we're not doing such a great job of it. So I think it's, it's when we look at things like infant mortality, we shouldn't be thinking, oh, that's moms who aren't taking good care of their babies. Those babies <coughs> who are dying are record keepers of our societal decisions. What, how we decide to pay, what we decide to pay for and not pay for, what we decide to tolerate, like allowing people to live in low-income marginalized communities, or, or letting people have guns so they can shoot each other up in communities. Sorry, I should degenerate into politics. But you know, these, kinds of, these kinds of things do have an impact on health, and they are records of our decisions. So it's just important to take it upstream and think about those, those factors. So um, cumulative pathways. Those are the experiences that you have each day. They add up to determine your health throughout your life. So that mom's experiences before she got pregnant, what was she exposed to? You know, what maybe she was sexually abused as a child, maybe she didn't have a scene when she was a teenager, maybe she was homeless when she was a child. All kinds of things impact your health that create a not optimal uterine environment for that child. Um, and then for the child itself, you know, here's a healthy kid, but maybe because of mom's mom's experience in life isn't as healthy as it could be, and then other things can continue to sort of push that trajectory down. If the child's in an environment where they don't get to go to early um, child care, or mom has to work, maybe dad's not around, um, the kid's alone a lot watching television, these are things that really push that trajectory down. The kids in a low-income neighborhood where the schools aren't as good, another societal decision that we make, how we choose to invest our money, that child doesn't then have the same opportunity. Um, but if the kid does have a good opportunity, then maybe he, she will be able to graduate from high school. And we do know that things like kindergarten readiness predict high school graduation. If you're ready for kindergarten, you're more likely to graduate from high school. If you graduate from high school, you're more likely to do well in life and be able to be a present, healthy parent yourself, as we see in this photograph. Um, but kindergarten readiness is, is predicted by a lot of things that happen in here. You know, many of us are working in the zero to five arena. What happens here and what happens here? What children and families are exposed to in these early years can impact whether that child's going to be ready for kindergarten and be able to have this um, optimal trajectory that we all hope for. Any questions about that? Is this too much? Am I talking too fast? No. no. Have you seen that before? Have people seen that slide before? Okay. So then I, mean, I just want to say, okay, makes sense. Let's just look at some data. I'm going to back to data. How do race, income, and place, we talk about neighborhoods, affect health over the life? So when we look at these data, we see that in Allegheny County, compared to whites in the Oakland Hills, African-American children in East Oakland are more than two times more likely to be born low birth weight. We saw those data earlier. They're 10 times less likely to have a mom who graduated from college. A mom who graduates, college is not for everybody, but it is somewhat of a predictor of success um, in life and in being able to have the time and energy that you need to help your child do well. So it's a predictor of infant health. Um, 
those children are 32, 32 times more likely to live in poverty and three times less likely to read at grade level by third grade. Third grade reading level is also predicted in high school graduation and is also driven by kids by inventions. All of these things are linked. The life course really, perspective really shows us that they're not disconnected stages. We can't fix it in prenatal care. All of this stuff is connected. One thing leads to another. And as an adult, it's five times more likely to be unemployed. So this is African Americans in East Oakland versus white state and hills. And almost three times more likely to die of heart disease. Again, the Barco hypothesis, what we talked about, the risk, the low birth weight connection to heart disease. This is bearing out in our data in, low, in, in Alameda County. So that, and that adds up to a cumulative impact of a 14 year difference in life expectancy. So all these things start early. They start early and they're a product of people's environment. Those are main, the main points I'm trying to make. Is that coming through? Am I being obnoxious? No. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so let's look at the neighborhood context. So what do we see? What do we see here? I'm thinking about the impact of the place on health. What do you notice in these photographs? Green streets. Green streets. Green streets. Green streets. Green streets. No mm -hmm. fashion streets. Mm -hmm. They're not mm -hmm. clean air. Mm -hmm. Clean air. Looking yeah. at the air well, assuming, assuming that the air is clean. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of cars. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of cars. Mm -hmm. They're not wearing helmets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So does this seem like it would be a healthy place? <laughs> it would be a healthy place to grow up in. If you yes. can imagine. Yeah. Look, looks like some place probably, you know. Maybe, right? Okay, so then what about these pictures? What do you see here? That seems worth, yeah, this looks familiar to a lot of people, right? This is the context of a lot of families that we sort of live in, right? So if you see this young man here, clean the trash, doesn't look very happy. He left in buildings, different stores. I don't know if you can tell that that's a fast food we had. Not very inviting. Yeah. yeah. No green space. No green space. There's a little bit of grass there. No, no, no green space. Unhealthy food choices. Unhealthy food choices. Yeah. So no supermarkets, things like that. He is cleaning up, though. He is cleaning up. So I mean, that's a really good thing to note that there are strengths, obviously. People have strengths. People have incredible resilience. We know a lot of people who are growing up in neighborhoods like this, and they're doing okay. I mean, so we always have to remember that it's not right. It's not right to grow up in a neighborhood like that. Again, another one of our societal decisions that we allow this. Do folks know Tony Eiten? Yes. So he grew up in Canada. And I heard him give a talk once when he talked about how he came to the U.S. to go to John Hopkins Medical School. And he's in a cab. And he said, and there was, this, there was this black guy driving me around, and we're driving through the hood, and I'm in the back of this cab, and I'm looking at him and I'm saying, who? What? What is this? He's from Canada. He's never seen a neighborhood like that. And he says to you know to this guy, how what is this all about? And the the cover says, no, oh, it's just it's the hood. We're in the hood. We accept it. He said, how do we live in a society that accepts that it's okay for people to live in a community like that? Um, so I always think about Tony when I look at these slides. But I actually think he put these slides together when he was at the health department. Place matters. Place matters. Yeah, because he's, he's had that whole focus of place matters, which he continues at the California endowment. So it's a certain amount of that we accept as a society that it's okay for certain groups of people to live in conditions like this. And that's this whole concept of social justice that is you know, de facto not okay, but also, if we're interested in health, has a huge impact on people's health and well-being. Um, okay, so then just a couple of maps. And I'm going to show you these maps. Uh, this, I think, is in your packet, because I've heard, I got this just yesterday from one of our epidemiologists. Um, that, uh, we were really successful in Alameda County in changing people's ideas about how important place is by showing them maps. Because you can continually see that um, poor health outcomes are concentrated in neighborhoods that are disinvested neighborhoods like the ones we just saw pictures of, and the way there are high poverty rates. So here are the neighborhoods in Alameda County that are higher poverty, so darker brown is higher poverty. Um, and uh, you know, no surprise, West Oakland, West Oakland, and uh, Hayden Park and Hayden, actually share with them a little bit, are the great places where there's higher poverty. Um, this shows really clearly the social gradient in health. So what we mean is the connection between health and poverty, the connection between health and social inequality, social conditions, with something like infant mortality. So you look at, here's your infant mortality rate per thousand live births, 
going up to 10 per thousand. Here's your neighborhood poverty level. As the poverty level increases from less than 10 percent to greater than 30 percent, your infant mortality rate goes up. There's an almost three times difference between an affluent neighborhood and a poor neighborhood in terms of infant mortality. Is it that the moms in that community or dads in that community don't know how to take care of their kids or do a bad job? No, it's this other stuff. I mean, maybe that could happen in some cases. There are families all over who sometimes don't do a good job taking care of their kids as they should. But basically, what we're talking about is the impact of that place. Um, so then you see here the same thing. Remember where those high poverty neighborhoods were? Here they are. Here's where the high rates of infant mortality are. We can do this for um, life expectancy as well. So we made a pretty convincing case about how you know, if you're not healthy as a young person, your life expectancy is not going to be as high. So we see that same clustering of, of lower rates of life expectancy in those same high poverty neighborhoods, those disinvested marginalized neighborhoods. Oh, the foundation, I realize that. Okay, here are the, the neighborhood mm -hmm. will probably come out. Okay. Um, and then again, the same thing that we see, higher rates of life expectancy in affluent neighborhoods versus lower rates in the mm -hmm. Six years in this overall housing county. With a 14-year difference when we broke it down by East Oakland versus Oakland Hills. So, so then the question is, okay, I mean, we know this, right? Who are the people living in these neighborhoods? So one in 15 residents live in high poverty, one in 15 white residents live in high poverty neighborhoods compared to one in nine Asians, one in four Latinos, and one in three African Americans. Not a surprise to people. Although it's shocking, it's probably not a surprise. I mean, it's not okay, but it's probably not a surprise. So, how many people have heard of the mining or seen this map? So this may be just review. But the reason that I show this is that, okay, so for those of you who don't know, redlining is essentially the practice, this is a map from 1937, of deeming certain areas in a community as being good investments for mortgages versus risky investments for mortgages. So in this um, map, you see the green areas, again, Oakland Hills, Piedmont, as being good places to invest, to help people buy homes there, um, whereas the red areas were deemed as risky. These are the areas where the folks of color were living. These are the areas where white people were living. This is 1937. So those kinds of lending patterns and those discriminatory practices have reinforced the fact that these areas where folks of color were living are low-income, disinvested neighborhoods, whereas these are thriving neighborhoods like the ones that we saw in the picture because of discriminatory practices, because banks didn't want to make loans to people of color because that was deemed a risk. Question. So the Green Reinvestment Act was passed, I don't know, 30 years ago, with the goal of changing all this. No change. Right. None. Yeah. And do you, can you speak as to why that didn't work? Um, there really wasn't enough um, incentive for banks, but actually more consequences for it. And we now have to obviously have no consequences. That's correct. That's right. It's just, you know, it's just, it's just, just worse. And then you have to be used to have to worry about covenants that are written into things. But the purpose of that was to to make the lending practices equitable and include more people in more right. places. And it just, just isn't. Right, and I think it's a good example of people understanding that there's been some wrongdoing and that we need to rectify it, but not really doing it in the way that needs to be done. And holding the people who should be held accountable accountable. Again, another one of our decisions. And we extend it to you know, the predatory practices, you know, not giving the right rate. I mean, so, right. so even though you had this incentive, over time just got worse. Right, right. Exactly. Yeah, I was just thinking it's sort of all the federal government and then the housing policy uh, yeah. from not providing uh, to people, African American people who are in the army or people of other color with housing that was given to white people. That's right. And right. all your practices on housing where we have the hoods now. Yeah, those practices, all of that. That was a huge mis opportunity after World War II when veterans received housing, but it was white veterans and folks of color did not. So anyway, what, what you mostly notice about this though is that those are the same neighborhoods that we saw on the other maps, right? They're the ones where we have the higher rates of poverty and the lower rates of life expectancy. They're the same neighborhoods. So it flows from this discriminatory practice in the 1930s and earlier. And another one that is, you know, somebody was telling me that they bought a house where this was still on the deed in 1970-something or other. This, this is, these are called racially restrictive covenants. So on the deed of the house that you buy, it says, 
No person or person of the Mexican race other than the Caucasian race shall use or occupy any building or any lot in this. So again, really clear racist roots of a lot of this inequality that we're seeing in the developing outcomes. So and it's, and I, I know this is really distressing and I think sometimes people feel like, why are you doing this? Why are you talking about this? Why? It just feels like, especially African American folks in particular, have so many strikes against them that this country has just really done them wrong. And it's just really hard. Or I personally, maybe some of you have experienced this, and it's really, it's really difficult to hear about. But I think it's important to set that context. It's important to set the context for all of us, you know, of all races, especially white people, to understand the legacy of this. And it's also important for people to realize that there are certain things that have happened that are out of their control. I think it's possible for this to serve as sort of a, a maybe empowering is not the right word, but just a, wow, I get it. I see why things are the way they are and why life has been so difficult. On that previous slide, if you just go back and just open a second, I can't really see it, but that red spot up on top, um, down, come down, 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 down. And it's the East Oakland, but it's the hills. Come on, keep going to your right. To your right. That, 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 that is an area, that's a historically black hills area of teachers, superintendents, doctors, and so forth, but they happen to be black because that's where they're located, and that is so Isn't that specific. That, yes. Okay, it's not fantastic, but thank yeah. you for pointing that that's out. It. Because it does it does show that it's not necessarily about socioeconomic status. That's all it's about. about golf links, it's in the hills, right. eubolic area, you know, grass, right. locked, ranch houses, but they're predominantly black, and there are people who were doctors, lawyers, administrators, who settled up there. Yeah. <laughs> it's the sole, yeah. like, I'm yeah. so glad you pointed that out. not being located to anything else, but yeah. they have their own people. Yeah, right, right, right. So, anyway, um, I'll skip through this really quickly, but I think this is kind of intuitive, right? That if you're living in a high poverty neighborhood, you're more likely to lack access to employment, to be exposed to industrial chemicals and fuel releases. All of the neighborhoods along 880, you have a Chevron plant up in Richmond, those are all low income neighborhoods populated primarily by people of color. Um, you're more likely to be locked into view for overwhelming you know, violent offenses. That's a whole other talk, and you know, how we really should be thinking about how our criminal justice system is playing into all of this. Um, living in a little household, etc. So you just brought this up, Kim, so thanks for that. But I, I, I wanted to, you know, we talked a lot about how poverty and luxury the social gradient slide, so poverty and the mortality are related. And we also see that people of color are disproportionately represented in low-income neighborhoods. So they're more likely to be poor, more likely to have poor outcomes as a result of that. But what, as, what she just said, racism in and of itself has a deleterious effect on health, regardless of socioeconomic. And racism is deeply entrenched in our society. Um, whether it's internalized racism that people feel as a result of being made to feel less than their entire lives, institutionalized racism in you know, doctor's offices, hospitals, banks, whatever it might be, we talked about that a little bit, or personally mediated racism, which is just the stress that comes from experiencing somebody disrespecting you or, or you know, discriminating against you because of your color, the color of your skin. So that has an impact on health. And we see that in this slide here with our low birth weight rates. Specifically that, this is exactly what you pointed to Kim, is that here we have the affluent neighborhood, right? Uh, less than 10% poverty, but the African-American low preterm, no sorry, the low birth weight rate is higher. It's 8.6%, and it's higher than the poor whites. Greater than 30% poverty, blue line, 6.3%. So by more than two percentage points, it's higher. So that just points to the whole thing, the fact that Racism in and of itself is mediating for outcomes because probably of the stress that is um, associated with that. Um, and I think this one obviously is right now. But so nobody believes that their neighborhood or job should be hazardous to their health. And when we think about children in particular and what it's like for them to be living in neighborhoods like this, we see how these kinds of things, like you know, there isn't fresh food, they experience discrimination, the Y program is full, folks from the Y. I don't know how often that happens, um, but this is just an example of how sometimes there aren't a lot of opportunities for kids um, in low income neighborhoods. I know we worked really, really hard to make access and we did a good job, but sometimes um, it's hard for them. Or, Folks don't have their parents don't have the money to take them that sort of stuff. There's mold found in the house, substandard housing, that precipitates asthma, as does poor air quality. So these are all things that really have that stem from the neighborhood that have an impact on children's health. So let's see. 
I'm saying, how's everybody doing? It's 10.30, we promise a break. So I um, I wanted to, I have a couple of other slides that I want to show. Maybe I won't show them. I, I did want to ask people to give people a chance to reflect on this stuff. So maybe what we'll do right now is, is go to break. Let me put this slide on. So we'll come back to people in a second. Um, we'll go to break, and then when you come back, let's have a discussion. So we can just sort of pause and reflect on some of these things that we've talked about. Because I know it, it is, it can be kind of lucky to hear the stuff, and it's probably bringing up a lot of stuff people personally and professionally. So just go to break, get some food, relax, and then think about what this is bringing up for you. 